button, please. So thank you, Stefano. Welcome, everybody. Um, it is a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to briefly introduce today's guest, Professor Nana Perhoef. I won't go into much detail, and I will just provide some coordinates on her research path in order to set the context of today's talk. So Nana Perhoef is Professor of Screen Culture and Society in the Department of Media and Cultural Studies at Utrecht University. She specializes in the analysis of emerging screen media with a key interest in contemporary transformations in screen and interface cultures, as evidenced by a really interesting book, Mobile Screens, Visual Regime of Navigation. I can show it on the screen, in 2012 by Ada Amsterdam University Press. So Professor Verhoef has also published on early cinema, mobile screens and location-based media, interactive installations, urban media art and media architecture, situated art and media, and urban interfaces. She is co-lead of the interdisciplinary research group Urban Interfaces, and together with its members, she researches the role of technologies, interfaces, and various technosocial practices in urban and public space. Together with the University of Applied Science in Amsterdam, they organize also the upcoming edition of the Media Architecture Biennale. You can find the links of these two groups in the chat in two. Now, I think that I've spoken enough for the moment, and since I don't want to take up any more, any more of your time, I will soon shut up and give the floor to Nana Ferger for her talk, which, as you know, is entitled Urban Screens Interface Law. It's yours. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And again, it's such a pleasure to, to meet you. And I think our research groups and seminars, they're so um, connecting on various levels that I, uh, I very much look forward to discussing and to further have further, uh, a further relationship. Um, just a disclaimer, I have quite a, a long uh, presentation. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about enduring the pandemic, specifically the organization of uh, the Media Architecture Biennale that was just also uh, announced, and my book project on the creative humanities. And roughly, you could say one is about the role of media architecture and design in public space, and the futures implied in this design. And the other project is about the connection between design and other making practices and the scholarly pro project of the humanities. But more about this in a bit. Oops. A second level of the situatedness of this talk pertains to the specificity of the past year as COVID-19 has impacted our lives at home, uh, on the streets and in our work, that is our offices, classrooms and meeting rooms. And the past year has been challenging, frustrating, but also insightful and productive in different ways for all of us. Besides dealing with illness and perhaps even death, with anxiety and grief, stress but also boredom, going in and out of lockdowns, working and schooling from home in our layered shrinking and expanding bubbles, the possibilities for connection and exchange have diminished as well as differentiated and multiplied. As academics, our workload seems to have doubled, with our productivity both skyrocketing in some areas and grinding to a halt in others, depending very much on the moment or task at hand. Some new working formats, questions and debates may inspire us, but focus and overall physical as well as intellectual energy has also been escaping us at sometimes crucial moments. For me and my close colleagues working on the situated and mobile techno practices and designs of urban interfaces and media architecture from a humanities perspective, the current pandemic situation has triggered some fundamental reflections on the relation between the affordances of and practices surrounding our technologies and the fragility and volatility of the global nature cultures that we shape and inhabit. And in the face of these challenges, on individual and global scales and pertaining to our bodies, minds and hearts, questions about the possibilities and impossibilities for adaptation and resilience have been loud. 
These questions are sometimes urgent and demanding and sometimes inspiring. They pertain to our daily life, our work life and public life, and they interfere in our scholarly and didactic practices and ask how do our embodied experiences impact our thinking? How can we best redesign our research and teaching? And how could or perhaps even should we respond to societal issues, contribute to public debates? What are new or remaining possibilities for intellectual exchange? How can we foster inspiration and insight from the current moment that is productive for our larger and longer running research agendas? And what are methodological implications of the situation? Are the research questions now presentifying themselves? But also, that is simultaneously and intimately connected to our personal experiences and scholarly practices, how is the creative field responding? What insights are artists, activists, designers, performers, and curators giving us with their strategies, reflections, and proposals? What is their role in the contemporary or perhaps long-term reconfigurations of our homes, schools, offices, and public spaces? How can creative design suggest new contours for our public presence? shaping productive distance, rooting our passages, and making flexible the ins and outs within these spaces. Our response of acting to the current situation in the various realms we inhabit, whether or not all in the same space, home, school, office, etc., are negotiations of absence and presence, and navigation of changing circumstances, the rhythm and pace or stop motion of our activities and our various efforts to become mobile, stay connected or be productive. For me, these issues touch the heart of what I want to talk about, but also inflect how I think I can best organize this online presentation. So in the following, I want to bring into connection some current creative work that responds to frameworks, guidelines, and restrictions and possibilities for entering, exploring, and being present in urban public spaces, with a proposal for a triadic set of conceptual coordinates that together offer a creative humanities perspective on the shaping of such shared spaces for mobility, presence, and distance. I will present these sections, alternating between design cases and concepts, while presented in linear order as modular elements. This will allow you, as a primarily listening audience to this online presentation, to go in and out of focus or to shift between different modes of listening to and connecting with what I'm presenting. In focus, three cases or clusters of cases will be connected with three concepts. When you sh switch in and out of focus, I hope they still offer parameters for a common ground or shared terrain for further research. A terrain that can be plotted, enriched and reshaped with other cases and concepts. The design cases that I bring in are from my own perspective all local, in the sense that they are situated in the Netherlands, yet I have encountered them via mediation as I have not been able to meet them on the ground. So I will roughly sketch them for my proposal to take them as theoretical objects or objects to think with. The concepts, also three in total, are all taken from the collection I wrote with Iris van der Tuin and we just submitted the manuscript, published by Roman and Littlefield and appearing in November later this year. I will present them uh, in the form we have chosen for this publication, as this, I hope, will suit the online presentation format as well. So each entry offers an articulation or definition, a situation or context and background, and demonstration or application, and as such, unpacks the concept as a micro-argument. But let me first briefly position them as part of what we call the creative humanities. What is the creative humanities? 
The creative humanities take shape at the productive meeting point of theory and philosophy of the humanities, in, particularly, in particular inspired by new materialism and media and performance theory, and design disciplines and creative practices in the broadest sense. As simultaneously discursive and material, that is, as agentially cutting out objects, Theoretical concepts of the creative humanities are unique material with which research is being done. The research is intrinsically dynamic as concepts are never merely applied on objects. Rather, research with concepts is done in such a way that not only do we learn something about an object, but also and simultaneously do we sharpen our, our theoretical toolbox. For or from a position situated in the creative humanities, concepts are always performative and therefore methodological. As such, they are productive and experimental doings, enmeshed in theory and practice, rather than fixed retrospective labels for phenomena that seemingly exist before or outside of research, artistic design or other making processes. They guide us where and when we start or have started our research and to the encounter with or in which researcher and researched come both into being. Moreover, as inherently unfinished and transformative concepts are experimental, they open up to yet unknown territories of thought. And the creative in the creative humanities can be recognized in a literally productive connection between making practice and thinking practice. Making as through thinking and thinking as through making. Creativity is hence a fundamentally methodological quality. The methodologicity involved is emphatically experimental and comfortable with knowledge production in uncertainty or intermediacy multiplicity and friction. Thinking with, through and beyond concepts, creative humanities projects are creative in designing and developing their own methods and approaches as they seek to navigate and explore the productive connections and reciprocal relationships between the creative practices they engage with and to develop conceptual analytical approaches for what these practices also work with, through or beyond. Their engagement with contemporary artistic, cultural and societal issues, and as themselves fully immersed in the 21st century media and algorithmic condition, both the experimental scholarly and creative pro projects develop conceptual foci while also and at the same time design for debate. So the first set of cases um, I deal with the screening of and for mobility and the various temporalities, intervals and gaps involved. These cases I discussed in the recently published article I co-authored with Iris van der Tuin, so-called Corona dashboards, contact tracking apps and an artistic design for distance. COVID-19 related data dashboards or corona dashboards are primarily designed to give information on the spread of the coronavirus in, an, in certain areas. In order to track and trace the spread of the virus, data dashboards make use of several numerical indicators, often a combination of the number of deaths reported as directly caused by COVID-19, the number of IC beds in use for patients, the number of positive tests, an estimate of the percentage of infected people and the reproduction rate of the virus. The wording track and trace suggests that Corona data dashboards aim to provide as close as possible to real time information for governments, institutions and individuals to base their decisions on and often directly impacting possibilities for presence, mobility and contact. This information provides insights in the development of the coronavirus. We see climbing, stable and falling graphs, percentages and rates. What is obviously tricky about the dashboard 
are their suggestions to represent a state of affairs at a specific moment. There's always a delay between event, report, input and representation via the dashboard. And for that reason, the dashboards may, have also, may also draw on alternative sources of information, such as the Google behavior of a population, do we see an increase in searching for symptoms such as dry coughing or a fever in a specific region, or data drawn from sewage water tests as sewage water in signals infection in a community one week before the symptoms are noticed, such supporting information may narrow the temporal interval between the progression of illness in a measured body, the result of a corona test performed on that body, and the making public of this measurement, an interval analog to the, on, to the one between feeling okay and moving around freely and showing symptoms, testing positively, and what the test result may have in store for a person or community. It is the unsettling effect of the latter interval that Iris von der Tuyn wrote about in her short reflection on experiencing time and temporality during the first months of the global coronavirus pandemic. And here we must tentatively conclude that corona dash data dashboards with their factual representation and realist feel cannot really close the gap, offer direction or soothe any unsettled feelings. Contact tracking apps or corona apps respond differently to the coronavirus related temporal intervals. So, so many of us, both personally and professionally, want to close or respond to. And as such, they are designed and used differently and for a different purpose than corona data dashboards. Whereas the dashboards are intended to provide a source of factual information for institutions and individuals to base their decisions and behaviors on, contact tracking apps are themselves being sourced for information. The tracking apps are to be installed on mobile devices that are being carried around by on and on individual bodies, and they are primarily meant to store random anonymized codes based on the spatial proximity of two bodies as calculated based on the exchange of Bluetooth signals. These codes uh, of contact can be subsequently be activated once the body of an app user has been tested positive for the virus. And when someone reports a positive test result in the app, the codes or digital traces of contact can then be subsequently sourced for information to be provided to selected bodies or users. These app users are provided the information that they have been close to a carrier of the virus while the latter was in the interval between getting infected and showing symptoms. During the moment of contact, body user one was unknowingly and unwillingly in the state of potential infecting others. After the app has informed body user two about their risky proximity, body user two is in the same situation as body user one was before. And as such, the principles of tagging, tracking and retrospective tracing infuse the dynamic network of bodies with a complex and dynamic temporality and positionality that populates the standard corona interval we know from the data dashboards with personalized information, with the effect of settling some of the anxiety caused by the virus, yet it unsettles a clear distinction between then and now, there and here, and self and other, thus perpetuating ontological and deictic instability. The third design is between an art intervention and a prototype of distance design for public space. The smart distancing system developed by Dutch artists Jolan van den Riel and Nick Verstand, presented at the last edition of the Dutch Design Week, makes use of a combination of position tracing, motion tracking and distance measurements as a way to capture not COVID-related data, but the body in the interval of not knowing. Van der Biel and Verstand make use of motion sensors and lasers that either position individual bodies in flexible circles with a 1.5 meters diameter or beam 
contracting and expanding lines of this specific length on the floor so that passing bodies know where and how to keep a safe distance so as to not be at the risk of infecting or getting infected by other bodies. The intervention takes a state of not knowing as its very basis and responds primarily and explicitly to the ontological instability caused by viral, the viral pandemic. While the designers themselves call it an art project, they also point at the possible adoption for practical use in train stations, shopping malls, airports, or other crowded public spaces. And the makers state that they developed the spec speculative design with the question of how, with the creative use of technology, art can contribute to shaping to the shaping of a one and a half meter society as the pandemic situation is called in Dutch. And with their and that with their design, they aim to make physical distancing more fun, more beautiful and better functioning. So all functioning differently, each of these three cases raises the question of how the body is captured in a soma technical logic and what the implications of such a logic are for temporality and agentiality and the interrelation of both. And I propose to read the cases through the concept of soma techniques or as articulations of soma techniques. Oops. So this is where I switch to the text of the um, uh, the glossary of terms from a uh, critical concept for the creative humanities. Soma techniques is a neologism based on the word soma, body, and techne, craft, art, that expresses the interrelationship between bodies and technologies. As a concept, it makes critically analyzable how human and animal bodies are cut through with technologies and how technologies are supported by different types of bodies. The insight that technologies work on and function with, bodies give the bio, a biological body the agency to participate in processes involving its own materialization, as well as the materialization of subjects as amalgams of biology, sociology, sociality, and technology. This technologization of bodies links the individual body to the collective, social body, or body politic. While theorizing a relation between bodies and technologies that is intermediately, immediately interwoven and therefore more complicated than can be thought with disjunctive body or technology or additive body and technology logics, the single most important theoretical impetus of the concept of somatics pertains to critiquing powerful tendencies to naturalize bodies and to neutralize technologies that are rampant in philosophy, science, and society. The term summer techniques was coined in the period between the International Conference's Body Modification in 2003 and Body Mo Modification 2 in 2005 by the organizers and participants collectively. In 2011, the journal Soma Techniques was founded by members of this network. The theorization of how embodiment is always already technological and how technology is always already embodied and embedded is reflected in the work of critical theorists Samantha Murray, Margaret Childrick and Nikki Sullivan, who work at the intersection of gender, sexuality studies, media and performance studies, and studies of the body and health. Some of their work can be labeled critical disability studies, a field that departs from the recognition that every human being is a cyborg, as well as we are all cybernetic organisms, there is no difference in kind between wearing carefully crafted fashionable sports or orthopedic shoes, or, or using a walking stick or not, or walking up straight or moving around while sitting in a wheelchair. Some of their work can be positioned within the field of queer and transgender studies. And this field recognizes that not a single body exists without technology and criticizes the social and psychological assumption of categori 
characterizing only the trans body, that is not the not the cisgender body, as made possible by technologies such as pharmaceuticals, surgery, fashion, and makeup. Dispositive analyses. Uh, let me very quickly. Oh, see, I need to change the slides. Sorry. Dispositive analyses performed with some techniques as a key concept are situated, relational and dynamic, and move beyond critiques of common sense and scholarly notions of embodiment and technology by being creative with alternative forms of relating. Historian, theorist, and filmmaker Susan Stryker's multimodal and multi-year project, Christine in the Cutting Room, a film in progress, was uploaded to YouTube in 2013 by the Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry, a research center for collaborative, innovative, and interdisciplinary scholarship at the University of Arizona. The project combines research, documentary, and art filmmaking, and insights in surgical media and war technologies as ways to creatively rethink the embodied subjectivity of Christine Jorgensen an American actress, photographer, and transgender activist from the 1950s and 60s. In the, in the In Progress edition of Christine in the Cutting Room, the voiceover says, I was the bomb dropped on the gender system that blew up the body's meaning. I was this, this destroyer of binaries in a world split in two. I was the world's first transsexual celebrity. I was an avatar of the atomic age. By referring to the practices of both celluloid, celluloid cutting, working with images uh, and a transient medium, and surgical cutting techniques and technologies of the gendered body as practices that happen in a cutting room, Stryker's project manages to connect and traverse the disjunctive temporality and relationality of the cut of the techno body and its image with its social political force. So now to move to the second set of cases. The second set of cases represent the figurations of intermediacy that provide temporary sonographies for performing, performing presence in public space. And these are cases taken from the short essay I co-authored with my colleague and theater and performance scholar, Sigrid Merckx. Looking around in the cities where we live and work and in the international cities we connect with through our various media channels we use, we see arrows, circles, points and lines popping up everywhere. They add fugitive inscriptions on pavements grass, monuments, and wall surfaces that act as canvases for imaginary imagery and writing with ephemeral materials like chalk, tape, paint, and light. Such plotting not only punctuates space, marking the here, but also suggests a route to follow, a marking of how to follow different, different here's to get to there, a plotting of a staggered mobility. We, we can see the use of dots or closed circles and the lines between them to indicate intermittent standing positions and the procedural order to follow to get to the end point. But we can also recognize a plotting of presence in the use of open circles painted in, for example, the grass in parks as the outlining of spatial containers or terrains, a plotting of dwelling such marking, markings of container spaces can also be seen in the plotting of spaces for collective presence. For example, the bracketing of standing positions by painted dots and circles or taped off squares plotting public spaces for collective protests. Plotting as urban scenographic act in current post-lockdown cities Thus involves the use of figures and shapes that both indexically indicate and symbolize an endorsed position, a dot or closed circle marking where to stand, or the border of a terrain as safe spaces with open circles or squares marking both an inside and outside of where one can best be present 
among others. So how to understand these visual forms that shape and outline? Following this short article of Merckx and myself, I here propose to read, to read the cases through the concept of figuration as articulate, articulating figuration. As a concept, figuration refers to the creative act of producing form for thought, but also to the process of the taking shape of thought figures, as well as to the result of this act and process. As such, figuration cuts across traditional categorizations of the figurative versus the abstract as two distinct categories of representation in art history. As a concept, figuration offers a perspective on the way in which thought figures are drawn, take shape, and produce thought. Working from Gilles Deleuze's time image and Jean-François Lyotard's notion of the figural, media philosopher David Roderick deconstructs the opposition between word and image, and between philosophy and aesthetics, and elaborates the figural as a central concept for analyzing digital audiovisual images, not as prefigured fixed sign structures, but as temporarily oriented audiovisual events, pointing at the meaning of the experiential that exceeds discourse and the semiotic. He invokes Lyotard's recognition of the force or movement of figuration when he writes, in homage to Lyotard, I can thus present a first definition of the figural as a force that erodes the distinction between the letter and the line. The letter is a closed, invariant line. The line is the opening of the letter that is closed, perhaps elsewhere or on the other side. Open the letter and you have image, scene, magic. And close the image and you have emblem, symbol and letter. The task of the analyst is therefore not to approach the image as a representation pointing to a past, but to unpack the image as a figuration of its potential futurity. Taking up this multidirectional understanding of the figural from a creative humanities perspective, the concept of figuration activates the processual and performative connotation of the verb to figure and thereby emphasizes the act before in connection with the process during, after, and beyond the encounter with thought figures. Figurations as an enactment of the figural can take shape as anthropomorphic thought figures. Think of Rosie Bredelty's Nomad and the Posthuman, Michel Serre's Zambellina, Donna Haraway's Cyborgs and Companion Species, or more abstract geometric shapes, lines and forms. That is a circle, arrow, bracket, or matrix. Anthropomorphic figurations are proposals in philosophy and cultural theory for figures to think with, so as to recast traditional, fixed, dualistic, and gendered human subject positions by introducing these new figures of difference. Geometric shapes, lines and forms can similarly be both expressive on and simultaneously producing emerging thought. These figurations express the spatiotemporal dynamic structures and emergent relational constellations within which human subjectivity is produced. When architect and theorist Bernard Schumi speaks of concept forms, we can recognize a similar, similar take on the connection between theory and form in his performative perspective on architecture. The concept forms he recognizes in architectural projects are, for example, the circle, the dome, the envelope, but he also points them out in larger com composite architectural structures, such as those of linear, concentric, and grid cities. Not only does architecture as material design depart from concepts, he argues, but it also produces forms of knowledge. 
With his focus on how material design affords movement and events, he foregrounds how architecture entails a structuring of spatiotemporal experience, as well as making arguments and proposing ideas. The concept then he positions before, during and after the act of architecture. As a concept for the creative humanities then, figuration is the proposal to think with shapes or forms that can be considered scenographic in essence, as it prescribes and inscribes and thereby draws out possibilities for seeing and thinking, emerging, emergence, transformation and relation that are enclosed in shape, line or form. Both anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic and geometric figurations are similar to making concepts, which brings to the fore how philosophy, cultural theory and design, that is scenography, architecture, installation, may share a double-sided creative and conceptual impetus to give abstract thought shape or form as a creative philosophical act is to materialize thought, to make thought possible and happen. Moreover, to approach or take a specific shape or form as figuration is to conceptualize it, to accept the shape or form as a concept to think with. Lastly then, the most recent case I want to bring in opens up yet in another way the spatial and temporal coordinates of being present and connected. Oops. Apologies, I have to find my screen. I'm not going to show the um, video, but I'm happy to share my presentation afterwards and you can use all the links to see the materials uh, closer up. So from the end of March until the beginning of May, the Pult Museum in the Netherlands presented National Chain 2020 Social Practices, a project by the American artist Rita McBride and a collaboration with the German Cypriot choreographer Alexandra Weierstahl and students from the Fontes Dance Academy, located in the city of Tilburg in the Netherlands. Planned uh, to be able to uh, be shown live, if, if possible, for the duration of the Pont Museum, like for the duration that the Pont Museum, like all museums in the country, had to keep its doors closed. The project, however, could also be followed via live streams and on social media, specifically via, via the project's Instagram account. The work consists of a reinstallation of Rita McBride's work, National Chain, from 1997, uh, a monumental grid that is suspended on shoulder height throughout the central museum space in a former textile mill and divides the space into segments of equal size, not coincidentally in squares of 1.5 by 1.5 meters. And for the duration of the museum's closure, the installation was activated and demonstrated by the dancers. As stated by the project's press release, National Chain 2020 is in response to a request from the Pons to address the remarkable impact COVID-19 has had on society. Visitors are encouraged to engage with the floating structure and navigate together, exploring the perspective shift that allows for funny, playful, and informative interaction in the newly defined public space established in 2020. Yet, as we know now, the dancers had to be our proxies as visitors could not enter the museum themselves. And Rita McBride, the artist, states, quote, 2020 has brought us many opportunities to become more conscious of the basic assumptions we have for accepted social interaction. National Chain has always provided a shift of perspective for people who have engaged with the installation over the years. It always offered experiential surprise and humor, providing new positions for looking, relating, moving, and standing still. And quite. 
There are many points of connection between this work and today's question uh, around de redesigning the contours for connection in public spaces, not only because of its symbolic use of a suspended grid materializing in and taking over the museum space, but also because of its shaping off and in intergenerational, interdisciplinary and intermedial collaborations its experimental characteristics as well as its multi-platform and spatial temporally and materially distributed format. So I propose to look at this work with the concept of crossing, to investigate the interconnections between the work's format, its performativity and its implications. So this is the third and last concept, bear with me. The concept crossing both activates its meaning as a noun, a crossing, and as a verb, to cross. As such, it harbors a specific spatial temporal logic. As crossing as a meeting point is both an endpoint and starting point, a where and when crossings can happen and take off. A crossing is a nexus in motion, a movement of convergence of a past, intersection in the present, and divergence towards the future, with the performative potential of interference or diffraction. The letter X as a cross visually symbolizes the figuration of this dynamic. The legs meet in the middle and take off in continuous flight, yet also diverge in an opposite direction. Left becomes right and vice versa. Significantly, the letter X has been used in XR as a genre label for extended reality, which as a bracket contains such technovisual subgenres as augmented reality, mixed reality and virtual reality. There, the X is more than an abbreviation. It also conceptualizes how such digital, mobile, and interactive visualization technologies work towards various forms of crossing reality, and in particular, how such crossings afford a range of forms of relating. This relational perspective makes dynamic the otherwise more static bipolar logic inherent in a con common conceptualization of the physical and the virtual as two intrinsically separate or even if hybrid or blended domains. As such, XR can be conceptualized as a crossing reality. Using XR as a bracket for various visualization technologies that work with the intersections of and movements between realities demonstrates how crossing as a concept can be particularly relevant for the creative humanities. Crossing in XR or crossing reality connects to onto-epistemological thinking of multiple co-constitutive and emergent registers and domains of reality with a fundamental performative fundamentally performative perspective on technology. As such, XR extends an invitation to think and work with uh, technologies to explore and experiment with designing and staging their affordances for various forms of experiences and subject positions of crossing. Feminist literary scholar Elizabeth Meese has pointed out how the meaning of crossing can also have a recalcitrant or an emancipatory slant to defy the rules, transgress boundaries, or betray by, for example, intentionally doing the opposite of what is expected, conventional or correct. Crossing is also a conceptual kin to what more recently has been discussed by historian, theorist, and filmmaker Susan Stryker and her colleagues as transing, that is, c categorical crossings, leakages, and slips of all sorts around and through the concept of trans. And this is what they argue. Quote, it's common, for example, to think of the trans in transgender as moving horizontally between two established gendered spaces, man and woman or as a spectrum or archipelago that occupy, occupies the space between the two. 
But if we think instead of trans uh, along a vertical axis, one that moves between the concrete biomateriality of individual living bodies and the biopolitical realm of aggregate populations that serve as a resource for sovereign power, what if we conceptualize gender not as an established territory, but as a set of practices through which a potential biopower is cultivated, harnessed and transformed or by means of which a certain type, kind of labor or utility is extracted. Trends thus becomes the capillary space of connection and circulation between the macro and micro political registers through which the lives of bodies become enmeshed in the lives of nations, states and capital formations, while gender becomes one of several sets of variable techniques or tempor temporal practices such as race or class, through which bodies are made to live. Such critical and political implications of crossing as a form of transing has been picked up by the artist and theorist Misha Cardenas in the Trans Real Political Aesthetics of Crossing Realities in 2012, who together with editors Al Mermat and Amy Sarah Carroll explores the crossing of multiple simultaneous realities in contemporary art, particularly mentioning augmented reality, mixed reality, and alternate reality. Considering what they call trans reality as a crossing of realities, they propose that this aesthetics crosses boundaries created by a proliferation of notions of reality as coming both out of both critical theory and creative practices surrounding emerging technologies. So how to close this modular and open-ended presentation, I think perhaps abruptly. It was my intention to suggest some conceptual coordinates to think about, and with design proposals, interventions and performances that respond to the need to rethink the shaping of our public spaces and offer possibilities and restrictions for presence and mobility within the paradoxical parameters of spatial distance and temporal gaps. I also propose a modular thinking that keeps open and responsive or flexible the position and connections between such coordinates and the terrain between them. So I think now it's time to continue a more dialogic conversation. So thank you for listening, and I'm really eager to hear your thoughts. A beautiful mark <laughs> to mark that ending. I'll stop uh, sharing. Thank you so much. Uh, should I talk or Tommaso? You okay? No. Well. Uh, there are so many, so many interesting things you you uh, uh, gesture towards, and uh, there are so many interesting problems and very difficult to uh, disentangle. Uh, it's ve it's a very complex and stimulating picture. Thank you so much. Mm, just to to break the ice, uh, and then I'm sure there are more questions uh, and uh, perhaps more precise questions but my thought while you were uh, speaking uh, went to mm, a very large <laughs> perhaps banal i don't know uh, consideration which is uh, modernity has been characterized by the progressive movement uh, of uh, the destruction of limits, of boundaries, of uh, um, uh, you know the perhaps exaggerated uh, uh, an individual um, transgression of every traditional kind of uh, of link. And uh, but at a certain point, I remember uh, in particular a debate that came out when uh, um, the book by, um, uh, by Charles Taylor came out, uh, uh, A Secular Age, um, uh, about disenchantment and reenchantment uh, and uh, uh, the, secular, the secular individual, etc. 
And then there was a, an article uh, which came out on the journal New Atlantis, I guess, uh, by Alan Jacobs. And uh, it talked about a buffered self, that is, the, the, the individual, the, the modern subject, uh, as uh, a self that is buffered, that is uh, secure, uh, um, encapsulated into a number of limits, that uh, uh, distinguishes uh, him or her from uh, non-modern or pre-modern subjects who were um, prey of uh, different forces, demons, magic forces, uh, social forces, while the, the modern individual is uh, experiencing uh, these, these forces or these uh, uh, crossing of limits only fictionally, because he is buffered, he is secure in his limits. So, on the one hand, the modern subject that breaks all the boundaries, on the other hand, within a cage of uh, boundaries, of limits, of autonomy, if you want, but without the disturbance of, uh, of other powers, of the... And uh, what you were... Um, presenting today is really a battlefield of uh, limits, of boundaries, of uh, the, the, the breaking of boundaries, the, uh, the um, new movement of boundaries. I mean, the, the words uh, you chose uh, among your, uh, your list uh, um, are very interesting. Soma techniques, so the boundaries between uh, biology and technology, if you want, or uh, um, uh, the, the artificial boundaries between, <laughs> between technology and uh, we are uh, all cyborgs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the figuration that erodes the distinct, distinction between the letter and the line, again, uh, another battlefield, battleground for boundaries, and also, of course, the, uh, the crossing. So my question is, uh, how real is this uh, uh, demise of, of the buffered subject, of the buffered individual? How um, real uh, is this uh, demise, uh, let's say, actively um, performed. We, we, we witnessed today uh, a passive form of demise. I mean, with the coronavirus, of course, uh, we all felt fragile, vulnerable, uh, and, uh, and so all these strategies, uh, sometimes funny, like the physical distancing, mm, uh, or these are ways of negotiate the boundaries uh, uh, so, uh, and the, in this case, they are they are real. But, but, uh, do we passively suffer this uh, 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 demise of the of the buffer self, or are we really able to break uh, these uh, these uh, secure and comforting cages that we probably built around us uh, as individual? What is your perception? I'm sorry, it's, it, it's a little bit confused and a very broad question, but... It, 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 it is first and foremost a, a, a massive question. <laughs> yes. It's like, so what's the status of the human, uh, the, uh, the human subject in this day and age? Right. <laughs> and, 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 and you speak, um, uh, I, I mean, I, I, uh, I cannot directly speak to the concept of the buffer itself. Uh, uh, this is uh, a, a new concept that I've got to... Uh, um, uh, but it's interesting how the the set of the the conceptual the set of words that you use are so sort of diametrically opposite 
um, this, maybe we can call it a sort of algorithmic uh, logic. So we have the buffered self and the demise and the break and the working against breaking in and out of boundaries. And then we have this more navigational perspective where the individual is negotiating and going in and out of uh, roles, going in and out of frameworks, uh, uh, being uh, uh, not free to go where she wants, but at least being uh, working, living in a, um, a sort of uh, uh, navigational form. And I think th these two, two images, and sorry, I, I, I keep uh, uh, seeing this as a as an image of a uh, sort of a castle and a, a, you know a walls and and you're either in the terrain or out of the mm -hmm. terrain and then you're vulnerable but within the terrain you're of course encapsulated and then this other uh, sort of zigzagging uh, sort of um, uh, uh, thumbelina like uh, figure that is um, uh, also vulnerable. In, uh, because uh, she would have to make choices all the time. She would have to be uh, aware of and, and resilient to being in various different uh, regimes. And, 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 and see, uh, I'm, I'm even mimicking the sort of the physical suffering and then. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a very different uh, uh, image. And, and I think um, uh, that, that first image, like, are we really, and then it's really a question of yes or no, are we in that buffered uh, 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 existence or are, is it a demise and are we not? And then it's a yes and a no. Or we could go to a question of how are we both ends. How are we buffered and not? And what happens on the moments when we go in and out of that situation? And I'm inclined to ask that kind of question, or I would propose that as a perspective. I mean, not for, I mean, this, I don't, I'm not maybe very eloquent about it, but I see this also a little bit as the difference between a an argument and uh, the plotting of perspectives that opens up, hopefully it works, maybe you say it doesn't, but to open a, some sort of more flexible per, um, sort of uh, perspective that, that can also be enriched, can also be changed, can also be added to. Yeah, I don't know if that makes any no, sense. Thank you, thank you very much. And I realize uh, when I'm realizing when you are speaking, that my perspective was limited to, it is true, from the point of departure was a sort, was a sort of a binary perspective, while uh, this flux, this uh, continuous movement, so the, the very concept of limit is uh, inadequate, although it, it can uh, pop up, uh, pops up <laughs> whenever it pops up, but it's not uh, um, a starting point. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's also with these, these questions and the sort of the, the framework. Are you in a binary framework uh, or, or have a binary question, let's put it that way, or w whether you have a question about uh, uh, movement and relationality. There are different questions, almost in a, a different paradigm. At the same time, I don't think the one completely sort of effaces the other. It's, it's just different types of questions. And um, so the idea of the buffered self, and again, I don't know what exactly the argument is there, so I cannot really speak to it, but imagine that, that indeed, if through that lens, you could say, okay, now we're beyond that situation, and what does it look like then? Fine, maybe, yes, maybe it's, it's a valid uh, a way of thinking historical difference also. So what, uh, it's maybe productive to see an essential difference between uh, the, the modern, the pre-modern, the post-modern, the whatever uh, the lineage is that you want to sketch. Uh, so I don't think, I, I, don't pre, pre, I don't want to pretend that, that this other sort of more uh, hypertextual network kind of perspective would make that obsolete. It's just a different type of question. Right, right. I know you're right. 
I think there are other questions I, I see. At least. Stefano, if, you, if you agree, I will take up the moderation. Sure, uh, yes, let's do that. You, okay, se ci sono domande, l'ho già scritto, potete, insomma, fatemelo notare nella chat e vi do la parola. So there is a question from Manuel Maximilian Triolo, so please, Manuel, do you just show, show up? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, I hope this uh, question is not too, too abroad, too, too, too confused, but uh, I will try. I will try the same. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the COVID era, era in the, this time, we uh, we saw a grow in the in the in the video games medium. Uh, the number are exploding and. Uh, uh, it did uh, have a, some kind of meaning, I, I suppose. Um, linking with this question, with uh, what uh, Stefano Valotti said about the disenchantment and the reenchantment, there are some scholars that uh, uh, suppose that video games are a way to uh, reenchant the everyday life. So, uh, in, uh, in your uh, your. Uh, uh, presentation, the word fun uh, emerged a uh, few times. And what I'm asking is, uh, there is a connection between uh, the three concepts, uh, somato somatechnics, uh, figuration, crossing, uh, with the fun, with the game, there is a place for this kind of interaction between uh, uh, these aspects and uh, this genre these uh, video games, games, uh, gamification, uh, and uh, X, uh, X realities uh, characteristics. I hope uh, I can be understandable. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, do I understand correctly that you're asking me to speak to the idea, to the question of how fun and yes. playfulness, and maybe that 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 uh, openness of fun and play, other yes. figures in relation to this this thinking of uh, structures. And, yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's actually you rightly point out, and and thank you for pointing out that the word fun uh, reappeared. Actually, as I was reading it, I uh, first uh, struck me as well that there was a repeat in fun. Uh, and I, I think that's, uh, you know, I, I, as I recall those were words, I, I quoted um, the words fun used by the artists uh, of that uh, smart design thing and, and Rita McBride, I think, or the Font Museum. I think there it was also used. Um, I'm afraid fun is not a word I use a lot, but uh, I do have fun in my life, don't worry. But uh, uh, but I think it does refer, and you're indeed right, uh, to point out that that is very much um, at, the, at the, the heart of a uh, sort of, a, uh, it points to the heart of this moment, which is uh, indeed, going back to Stefano's, um, if I may call you Stefano, uh, um, uh, question about sort of the, 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 the encapsulation in systems, in formats, in dispositives. And maybe dispositive is actually something that is helpful to think about this. Um, I've, I've, it's a recurring uh, concept in my work, and um, from from of course Foucault and other thinkers, and 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 also um, uh, cinema uh, film theory. It's been uh, used very much about how the subject is fixated and uh, in some ways uh, subordinate to the system or the dispositive that she is part of or positioned by. And at the same time, I think it is a very helpful concept to look at dispositives that are different and that are, uh, and maybe dispositives actually quite helpful in thinking about this buffered self structure versus this more uh, navigational subject. It's a different dispositive and uh, um, that nonetheless also is about a subject that is emergent within a situation that is culturally defined, institutionally defined, historically embedded, uh, uh, geographically situated, and we're all subjects within situations that have so many levels of uh, uh, of, of influence, 
so to speak. And uh, I, I imagine a subject that indeed sort of um, travels that terrain. And this travel can be uh, 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 um, appreciated as or, or uh, experienced as open, free, or restricted, playful. And fun is also for me would be a category that that is about the the, the uh, experience of being present and being in relation. So, and this can be perceived as or qualified by us as fun. It's fun to do this, to be here, to, to meet people, to do things, or to be in close and in, in your own bubble can also be fun. So it's a qualifier of wherever we are. And, uh, uh, I guess it's a question that we have, you know, times are uh, sort of in crisis, our lives are uprooted, we're reflecting on where we are. So we're reflecting also in those terms. Do we feel anxious? Do we feel concerned? Do we feel physically well? Are we still having fun? Are we still connected? Um, yeah, I don't know where I want to, let's stop talking, but uh, I, I, this would be my response to what you're saying. Thank, thank you, thank you. So now we have a question from a brilliant young culture geographer that I would like to no. participate Yeah, Laura Lopresti, please. Oh, brilliant. Uh, thank you. Uh, so th thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I think you really put so many concepts that we will take months for a visurate, to visurate all of them. But as you know, as I'm obsessed with maps and mappings, and I was curious about your index because you put both cartography and performative cartography, if I'm wrong. So I wanted to know more about the fact that you distinguish the two and how they could also speak to this pandemic uh, situations. Because you also referred to all these pandemic signs like embedded on the urban scene. Uh, so to what extent they could also be seen as, a, I don't know, a new urban uh, cartography? Uh, and what is the place of cartography or performative cartography in all of this? So is that performative cartography that navigational you're talking uh, like? Uh... Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm almost inclined to, to grab the uh, the entry that that we wrote uh, and and uh it's one of the examples uh, in the index of terms that we have a sort of a first uh, concept a cartography and then a qualifier of performative cartography that we uh, feel um uh, is relevant to include in that entry. And uh, performative cartography is uh, something that I've uh, written about in the past in the book that Tommaso showed as well, and um, others have as well, about um, a sort of a navigational format that is cartographic, but rather than fixated, it's very much a performative um, uh, emergent type of cartography. And I think it, it, it could have been one other uh, uh, conceptual, if I would have more, I could I could bring that in as well, because I think it connects really well to that scenographic perspective on figuration, that uh, it's, it's a type of uh, cartography embedded in the urban landscape at the moment, temporarily so, with the arrows and the dots. I don't know if you have that in Rome, but we have it uh, abundantly around us in the Netherlands, these markings in public space that are temporary, but at the same time, so there's sort of an overlay of, of, of a sort of a cartographic drawing in the city that also creates a different type of movement than what would usually be the way of moving around. And these are, uh, 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 th these uh, are also performative, and that's why in the, the figuration entry we brought in the notion of um, uh, sonography. And here I think there's a conceptually a close relationship between sonography as the shaping of the possible action on a page, for example, and cartography as also shaping the possibilities of, of movements in that terrain that is cartographized and an emerging cartography that can also be transing this, mm -hmm. can be uh, different, can also emerges in the actual practice. And I love that image now that I'm freely speaking and sort of uh, uh, associations come in. Do you know the phrase of an uh, elephant path? 
Do you know that that if you have a park and you have lanes in a park and the grass in between, that if people consistently cross the grass, there is a path that emerges. And this, these are the, these pathways are the traces of people actually not conforming to the roots of passage. I don't know. It would be very interesting to map that against um, the lines and tape and root sections now set up. And at the same time, people ignoring them as well. I don't know about you in, in, in uh, where you are geographically are now, but around me, that we, uh, we're also crossing these lines that we are now setting up to, to sort of reroute how we move in the city. But it's a very good point, and I, I'm happy to send the uh, the entry on, on cartography if you, you're interested, and also in general, you know, the book is going to be open access and, and freely downloadable uh, uh, soon in, in November. So, but I, I'm happy to send more. You can, if I, if I share the PowerPoint or you can go to the website of the press, you can see many entries. And if you say, Hey, yeah. I'm interested in, in what you do with those terms, um, just let me know. And I'm happy to send the, the proofs or the PDFs. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Is there any other question? Oh, I don't see. So then I do have a question. Um, well, when I was preparing uh, your short bio, the, 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 the word public space came, came out pretty much, let's say. But according to your speech, I, would, I, would, I don't know if this is somehow provocative, but I would say that we are not anymore allowed to talk of public space, but we should talk about public space time. And I was trying, let's say, I just wanted to know what do you think about this neologism and how we should, um, 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 let's say, use it to talk. Yeah, no, uh, good question. And, and first of all, happy to make the disclaimer that I love neologisms. <laughs> I make them up all the time. I love them because I love concepts uh, and, 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 and also accept that concepts are always uh, temporary. So so when you use a concept that is traditional or that is known, it's in your use of that concept that you reactivate and, and reshape and remodel that concept. So every concept is new uh, in that sense when we make it. So in that sense, I love uh, terminology uh, because it, it does a lot. So, and I have to say that when you, uh, we're starting with your pointing out that I use public space in my bios and all of that a lot, I, uh, just to give a bit of background to that, is um, that uh, with uh, my, my research group, Urban Interfaces, and, and we, I'm, 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 you know, invited to speak about the urban, etc. But the question of the urban, in the sense of urban studies, is is really not my entry point to that topic. I'm very interested in it, but I'm a, a, a media performance scholar, and I'm interested in in, in concepts and philosophy. So, the, um, sort of the more uh, the social, also influenced by social sciences interest in urban studies, I'm, I'm slightly, that's not quite my field, but I'm interested in it because it's about, you know, media and art that, you know, the objects that I'm, I'm interested in um, as they are taking place in public space. So I very often use public space as a way to not say urban all the time, okay. uh, to, to say it's the specificity of a space and I'm interested in that specificity. So I'm not interested only in the works of art or in the screens that we use, but I'm interested in how they are, take shape and how we use them. And therefore, this spatial perspective becomes very relevant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would, public space time, yes, I would not use it in a phrase easily, like uh, uh, because public space is shorter and, you know, people. But um, it is actually a very good and just uh, uh, correction of the idea of public space because it includes this idea of emergent and performative practices. And this is what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in space as a container. I'm, I'm interested in this more spatial, temporal, uh, emergent perspective. But traditionally, I was, or not traditionally, but in my background, I've also been very much working on, for example, early cinema, and from a very historical perspective. 
So I think that um, it, it's not all emergent and open-ended. Uh, I'm interested in those dynamics, but how they take shape in also a historical moment, in a situated moment. So um, I would even uh, I would I would think of a neo neologist and that includes space time, public situatedness. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's, it's in any way. It's my response to your question. I don't know. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I don't see any further. Maybe. I have a question. I already talked. Yeah, please. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for your um, presentation. It was really demanding, <laughs> and, uh, in, in a good way. I mean, <laughs> challenging to say what you say. <laughs> my my question is about the the, the notion of the concept of um, a crossing. That I, I think it's really interesting, and I thought it was it was related to the accidental meeting. And um, I'm I'm curious about my question is uh, what kind of agencies required in this in this kind of framework and and I'm talking about the the, the notion of the crossing and this relation with the accidental meeting. Uh, I don't know what you mean by agency that is required. I think uh, I would think agency is. Um, uh, Oh, I hear myself in an echo. Let me turn down my sound a little bit. I don't like to hear my voice. Anto, chiudi il microfono perché sennò. Oh, sì, sì, sorry. Um, uh, where was I? Um, I think agency is precisely responding to. Uh, we talked about this before. These these uh, structures and these possibilities, but also. Uh, the possibility for encount chance encounters and serendipity, serendipity uh, and, and contingency. Those are also terms that are floating around in our in our book, by the way. And um, so uh, I don't know what you mean by what agency is required in that context. What, what yeah. kind of concept of an agency? I mean, uh, the subject here in this cross uh, what kind of, uh, of agency has, uh, and I'm, 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 talking, I'm thinking about, uh, for example, the concept of material engagement by um, Lambros Malafouris, when a, a subject is, has to engage with something uh, to let emerge uh, a cognition. Uh, I, I was wondering about the ex accidental meeting that could happen in this cross. Yeah, I think again for me, my default is to uh, think of this as a dispositive again, uh, where this crossing takes place, takes shape, and uh, it is in the negotiation of the possibilities and uh, uh, limitations of agency that uh, uh, this, this uh, meeting or chance encounters take place. So uh, the the notion of chance or of of, of of serendipity is is very often a sort of an outside entering, like it's an, the unexpected entering a situation that is supposedly not expected that or that is supposedly in harmony, and then there is this interjection of something outside of it coming in. And um, uh, uh, I think it's very important to to uh, uh, bring that in in our thinking of any situation or dispositive that has that potential of being interjected in or being uh, bring brought in chance encounters. But again, I have the feeling it's not quite what you're asking. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think you are quite there, and I'm 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 very interested in the in the, in the possibility to to uh, find some crosses in the urban spaces. I mean, uh, yeah. crosses that um, let uh, accidental meetings happen. Uh, I, I can I can develop my question and ask you where where to, where we can find crosses in the urban spaces in the post-COVID era. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I'm inclined to think, but apologies for being um, taking this as a very conceptual question rather than a sort of a, a sociological question. I, I would think this is, and, and I mean it very seriously, this is on street level. And very often when we think of systems and the city and the grid and the cartography and the structures, etc., as uh, forms uh, are seen from above, and the street level is actually where the encounter happens, where we run into things, where the unexpected may happen. At the same time, the street level is also um, uh, uh, highly organized and highly structured and policed and surveyed. And we're in public space, so we're also, uh, uh, it, it's a, disposit a classic dispositive also of, of self um, uh, uh, monitoring of our behaviors. So we may also wonder if the chance encounter is not is not something that is or should be sought inside of us. It's an openness to recognize the chance encounter, to respond to it, to become in connection with it, to uh, uh, to to, and then something, and and therefore the the sort of the theoretical concept of diffraction becomes interesting, where the one entity meeting the other creates, well, not a third, but creates sort of uh, a, 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 a emerge, a make something emerge in that encounter. So very often it's in the encounter that we meet ourselves, so to speak. So, um, when you say where is it possible, I would say anywhere, <laughs> but very much on the street level, and it becomes very much uh, on the level of the um, the uh, of the encounter. I would seek it via an in encounter. Yeah, I, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, yeah. It sounds like something to really continue. Thank you, thank you. Searching for it together, yeah. In a very good question, all very good questions. Stefano, you wanted to say something. No. <laughs> I already talked too much. No, I was, well, okay. Well, I was thinking um, about, uh, I like very much the idea of concepts that emerge while making things, not uh, concepts that are already there and just needed, just, well, needed to be applied, you know? So it's a way of extending perhaps a Deleuzean view of philosophy in creating concepts, but not only while thinking, because thinking per se probably doesn't exist. One thinks only doing things or talking or or acting, I don't know. But at the same time, you said you like neologies, Matt. I, I do too. The, maybe uh, there is a problem. The problem is that we witnessed uh, the creation of many, many neologies, and sometimes I fear that they do not uh, last, not because they should be eternal or new categories, that, uh, but they are too thin, they, they, they evaporate too quickly and uh, do not contribute to, uh, to create a new common feeling, let's say, or a culture, or if you want, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah just uh, to speak to that, I, I uh, agree, and I think there it is very different when we talk about, when we are thinking about neologisms that sort of uh, point to a phenomenon or, or a topic, and neologisms as concepts. And I think, therefore, it becomes very important to make these concepts uh, to theorize them, to work with them, not as labels, but to demonstrate their, uh, well, what we call in, the, in our book, the methodologicity, the method implied in the mode of thinking that, that can also work with in, um, uh, in practices. So uh, um, I think you, you, what you say, I, I agree absolutely, and actually, when we think of the moment now, you see a, a boom of, of glossaries and dictionaries and new art terms. And, and interestingly, 
not only in academia, but very much also driven by initiatives in the cultural field. Mm -hmm. And this is a signal that we're also inventing and that we're thinking about new words and we're, we're trying to grasp what's going on. And, and there's as much interest in this in academia as in, in the cultural field. And uh, so we, we were looking at that phenomenon and then our answer was to actually bring in yet another dictionary, but one that does, uh, we hope convincingly, but um, pick up on already uh, terms that are already going around or, or, or are um, uh, revisited in the current situation, but to not just uh, say what they would mean, but say what type of thinking they allow for. And that in itself, I think, is more the purpose of, of, uh, of what, we, what we wanted to do than the individual concept, because the, the format of the book I like because of that sort of um, modular uh, model rather than uh, one argument. Well, there is, of course, an argument underlying it, but it, 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 the intention is or the aim is to have that open so that, uh, yeah, there can be more uh, concepts coming in but you are hoping for a shared um, terrain, not on the level of content so much, but on the level of what these concepts do or can do. So there's this methodological and creative part of, of the concept. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that's uh, a perspective, yes. Mm. Please feel free if you have you know, uh, we can uh, exploit n none of her for more five minutes, I guess, but then <laughs> leave her <laughs> alone and rest a little bit. But perhaps we still have uh, five minutes if there is a... otherwise. So practically, Tomaso, do I send my slides for anyone who's interested to you, and and you can share them, or yes, yeah, is that a good uh, good idea? That yes. would be great. Yeah. Together with the entry on our own cartography. Yeah. And contingency. <laughs> yes, I, I have just left my email address in the chat. So, if from the public somebody wants to receive the material from Professor Verhoeck, just write me an email, and I will reply as soon as possible with all the materials she has provided. So, no. Okay. Problem. You can always also add it. Uh, just email me directly if you want with anything. I, I love to stay in touch and, and keep our conversation going. Yes, we as well very much and uh, i took some screenshots while you were talking but they <laughs> but they are worse than than uh, your uh, slides <laughs> no no <laughs> of your slides of your slides. Uh, okay. <laughs> well um, we i personally thank you very much but i want tomaso to close the 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 session and uh, and we'll stay in touch yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Verhoeff. It was a pleasure to hear you. Um, thank you for the others for the questions and for participating. Um, just to say that we will meet on the 11th of um, June with Professor Mario Neve. We'll be talking, uh, I, I don't have here the title, sorry, I, I'm, I'm doing something unpolite, but <laughs> we'll give a talk on the 11th of June. <laughs> so, it's the fatherhood. Uh, okay. It's incoming father. Oh, <laughs> congratulations! Not yet, not yet. Just yeah, it it yes. it this is a case of not yet, but <laughs> intermediacy, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much, everybody, for making fun thank of me. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. bye, -bye. Thank you.